Hi, Deb. Hi, Aaron. Not in clinic? Just on my way down now. Would you have a second to do a quick cannula for me? Sure. I've just noticed Mrs. White has a low potassium which needs to be replaced intravenously. I've ridden her up for 10 millimoles of potassium chloride with some normal saline. Right, she's had a, an auxiliary clearance on the left hand side, so, um, and given the concentration of potassium, I'll put a small device in a good size vein on the right. That sounds great. If you run into any problems, let me know, I'll just be in clinic. Sure, thanks. thanks. So much. See yes. you. Peripheral IV cannulation is one of the most commonly performed procedures for hospitalised patients and is indicated to establish short-term access to the bloodstream. It should always be remembered that peripheral IV cannulation is an invasive procedure which poses risks of complications associated with physical and sometimes even psychological discomfort for patients and should only be undertaken when absolutely necessary. This e-learning package is the first element in the training program designed to prepare clinicians to safely insert peripheral IV cannulae. You will learn the essential theoretical knowledge regarding relevant anatomy and physiology, the skills to ensure appropriate veins and devices are selected, how to perform safe cannulation techniques, the contraindications to using peripheral veins for cannulation, and prevention and management of complications which may arise. At successful completion of this training, you should be able to safely insert peripheral IV cannulae, promote excellence in the ongoing care of patients receiving intravenous therapy, so that every effort can be made to prevent harm and preserve the future venous access needs for all our patients. The skin is the largest organ in the human body and provides protection from the surrounding environment. It varies in thickness in different areas and is heavily infiltrated with nerves which react to temperature, touch, pressure and pain. Nervous infiltration also differs around the body with some areas more sensitive than others. The back of the hand is especially sensitive. Superficial veins, those normally used for peripheral IV therapy, are located within the subcutaneous tissue beneath the dermis. The epidermis and the dermis move freely over the structures beneath, and infiltration or infection can spread rapidly in this loose tissue causing cellulitis. It is important to consider the proximity of the peripheral nerves when selecting veins for cannulation. Contact between a cannula and a nerve bundle during cannulation can cause sudden and severe pain and may result in nerve injury. The circulatory system delivers nutrient-rich blood to the tissues and collects waste products for removal. With each beat of the heart, oxygenated arterial blood is ejected from the left side of the heart out into the aorta. Blood pulses forward at high pressure through the arterial network of arteries and arterioles, which then branch off into capillaries within the tissues. Blood continues to flow through the capillaries, where they merge to form venules and veins, flowing at a much lower pressure. Deoxygenated blood eventually returns to the right side of the heart, where it is then pumped to the lungs for oxygenation. After flowing through the lungs, oxygenated blood flows back into the left side of the heart before being pumped out again into the aorta. Arteries and veins often run alongside each other in the limbs. This facilitates heat exchange to maintain core body temperature. It is vital to know where arteries are when selecting a vein so they can be avoided. Arterial blood flow can also be present in unexpected places. Approximately 1 in 10 people have unusual arterial vessels which are usually superficial. These vessels can be detected by palpation and are pulsatile. 
Inadvertent cannulation of any arterial vessel is evident if there is bright red, pulsatile blood loss, and pallor, duskiness, or coolness of the extremity. If this occurs, the procedure must be abandoned to prevent later signs of necrosis or gangrene. The walls of arteries and veins are made up of the same three layers. The proportion of these layers differs between arteries and veins. The thick muscular layer in arteries makes them less easy to compress and offers more protection, which is important as this side of the circulatory system is under greater pressure. Veins have less integral strength and can be easily compressed. Veins contain valves to prevent backflow of blood. Valves are leaflets of tissue which line the veins and protrude into the lumen and are often found at the junction of veins. The tunica intima is the innermost layer and is extremely fragile. It is comprised of a single layer of endothelial cells which provide a smooth interior surface for blood to flow. The tunica media is the middle muscular layer. In both arteries and veins, the tunica media is innervated by nerves of the sympathetic nervous system, which control diameter of the vessels. Stimulation of these nerves during cannulation can cause sudden constriction or vasospasm, which can result in a failed cannulation. The tunica externa is the outermost fibrous layer and is also innervated with nerve fibres for regulating diameter. This layer offers anchorage and protection. I've been contacted by clinical staff about the legal consent process for inserting an IV cannula. I think it's important that we ensure all clinical staff fully understand the relevant legal issues. Well, I agree. It's really important from a medico-legal perspective that staff understand these issues. I think we should get the message out there straight away. Insertion of a peripheral IV cannula is an invasive procedure. Whoever authorises this procedure must ensure that valid consent has been obtained. Obtaining consent can be delegated to a member of the treating team who understands the procedure and is trained to perform it. The first step, of course, is to make sure that patient identification has been verified. Can we first of all start by checking your armband, please? And, uh, yes, sure. Okay, if you can tell me your name and date of birth, please. Um, yeah, Pauline White. 22nd of March 1975. Lovely, thanks for that. And did the doctor explain yes. why... For patient consent to, to be valid, it must be freely given. Specific for the proposed procedure, the patient must be competent to consent and consent must be informed. For consent to be informed, the patient must understand the reason for IV cannulation, if there are any other suitable alternative treatments to the proposed procedure and the inherent risks involved with the procedure. In effect, the consent process is part of patient education. Did your doctor explain to you that we needed to do this? Look, he did, yeah, but I'm just wondering if I can take a tablet instead. At the moment, we need to give this medication directly into your bloodstream so that it will work rapidly and effectively. We can switch you to tablets once we're happy with your progress. Mm, okay. We do need to make sure that we take good care of this arm while the IV's in, so we'll need to know from you the minute it gets sore or red. And you can talk to your nurse or doctor about that at any time. How long do you think it's going to stay in for? A maximum of three days. OK. Are you happy with all the information that you've been given? Yeah, look, I think so, yeah. OK, I'm going to go away for about five minutes and get everything that we need then, and I'll be back. All right, thanks. It's acceptable in most cases to obtain consent verbally from competent patients or they can indicate their consent by conduct. If a patient is unable to give valid consent, the procedure should be postponed and advice should be sought from a senior member of the medical team on how to obtain consent from the person responsible. The Alfred Health Consent Policy and Guideline, the Incompetent Person Policy and Guideline and Patient Identification Verification Guideline 
outline all these considerations. And clinicians who are novices in performing peripheral IV cannulation must familiarise themselves with the content of these documents. Okay, Mrs White. Hi. You all right there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Right, I'm just going to start by raising the level of the bed um, so that we can see things a little bit more clearly. Now, okay. I understand from your past history that we're not going to put the IV in on the left side. No, no, no. Okay, so we'll look on the right. Contraindications should always be considered, such as the arm where there is a functioning AV fistula or the side of a previous stroke or a lymph node clearance. Good. Okay. Now I've just got a tourniquet here. It's like a tight elastic band. Just going to pop that round your arm. Veins are easier to cannulate when the patient is hydrated. This is just to help Assisting the, the patient to relax and warming the arm can improve vein filling before the tourniquet okay. is applied. Get you to open and close your fist a few times. That's great. Positioning the arm below the level of the heart and asking the patient to open and close their fist with gentle tapping or stroking the skin may also help. Oh, you're nice and warm, so mm -hmm. that helps. Ideal veins for cannulation should be straight, feel soft and compressible and be non-pulsatile. So that's a good one there. All right, I'm just going to release this. The tourniquet should be released until the equipment is ready. And then I'm going to start setting up everything that we need. Okay. Superficial veins of the arms are more abundant and easy to locate, providing ready access to the circulation. Decisions made when selecting veins often determine the patient's experience with cannulation and a number of factors need to be considered before inserting a peripheral IV cannula. Patients should be included in vein choice where possible and previous experiences should always be considered. Mechanical injury to the vein can be minimised by inserting the smallest cannula necessary and by avoiding joints. Where known irritants will be infused, select moderate sized veins which have plentiful blood flow to rapidly disperse the infusion and importantly, avoid sites where there will be movement of the cannula. Veins of the hand include the digital and metacarpal veins and the dorsal venous arch. These veins are easy to locate, are splintered by bones of the hand and these distal sites allow more choices if further cannulation is necessary. Disadvantages to using these veins are the area is very sensitive to pain, the IVs at this site are prone to dislodgement when patients use their hands. Because these veins are small, they are not suitable for medications known to cause irritation. The cephalic, median and basilic veins are found in the forearm, the site that is most favoured by patients. Advantages in using these veins are, they are generally away from moving joints, veins are of good diameter and they are straight and usually easy to cannulate. Disadvantages are, they can run close to known arteries and nerves, they can be subject to movement if close to the wrist, the basilic vein is often overlooked as it is in an awkward position and has many valves. The cubital fossa contains the median and cubital veins. These veins are excellent for blood sampling and are often the only means of access for cannulation in an emergency. Routine cannulation at this site should be avoided because this site is prone to phlebitis, infiltration and infection due to joint movement and the difficulty in maintaining intact dressings. 
known arteries and nerves pass through the cubital fossa. And cannulation at this proximal site limits options for further cannulation if necessary. Provision of a safe environment for patients and healthcare workers at Alfred Health is a top priority. Even with the best intentions, the insertion of invasive devices has the potential risk to cause complications. Evidence-based practices at Alfred Health, such as aseptic technique incorporating the five moments for hand hygiene and safe cannulation techniques are all crucial steps that need to be taken. It's also important to acknowledge that a potential risk exists for healthcare workers when performing this procedure through exposure to blood and bodily fluids. Clinicians must always ensure that personal protective equipment is worn correctly and appropriately. Please take time to study the Alfred Health Guidelines, which present strategies to minimise these risks and the steps to be taken if exposures occur. The prevention of infection associated with peripheral IV cannulae requires that a number of practices be optimally performed at the time of insertion. The insertion of peripheral cannulae should be performed under aseptic conditions and using a recommended skin antiseptic. Surfaces should be cleaned down immediately prior to any procedure, even if visibly clean. Hand hygiene should be performed immediately prior to assembling procedural equipment. The centre of the aseptic field protects procedural items from contamination and a non-touch technique should always be used when adding items to it. If contamination of equipment occurs, start again. When drawing up the flush syringe and priming the extension tubing, key parts must not be touched. Directly handled items must remain away from the centre of the aseptic field, otherwise contamination will occur. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I just tighten the tourniquet again and we'll just refill that vein so if you can Good. Okay, I'm just going to stroke your arm a little bit. All right, now I'm going to clean the skin with something very, very cold. Okay. 0.5% chlorhexidine gluconate with 70% alcohol is the recommended agent for skin asepsis, unless the patient has a known allergy. Both chlorhexidine and alcohol have antibacterial properties, and chlorhexidine also exerts residual antibacterial action at the skin surface for an extended period following application. Once the skin surface has been prepared, care must be taken not to repulpate the intended insertion site unless sterile gloves are worn. Now we just need to wait for that to dry. Does it feel cold? Yeah, it does feel cold, yeah. It'll evaporate soon. Looking closely at the cannula, you will see that the introducer tip extends beyond that of the cannula itself. Ensuring the cannula is bevel up and only handled by the flashback chamber, apply gentle traction to the skin. This produces a taut surface for the point of the cannula to smoothly enter the skin. 
Gently insert the cannula over the vein at an angle of 30 degrees and slowly advance until blood can be seen entering the flashback chamber. This indicates that the introducer tip of the cannula is now in the vein. Stop here and lower the angle of the cannula towards the skin to 10 degrees and advance another one to two millimeters to ensure that the tip of the cannula itself is now in the vein. Handling the hub, slide the cannula over the introducer into the vein, taking care not to allow the introducer to also advance. If this does occur, the introducer may pierce the opposite wall of the vein, resulting in failed cannulation. Scratch come in. Release the tourniquet and place sterile gauze beneath the hub. If the patient is cooperative, the introducer may remain in to occlude blood flow. Compress the vein proximal to the tip of the cannula and remove the introducer. Connect the IV attachment to the cannula, taking care not to touch the insertion site. Aspirate blood to confirm cannula placement. The cannula should flush easily. A non-touch technique for IV cannulation will ensure that key parts and sites are not contaminated and a sterile dressing should be applied to secure and protect the insertion site following placement of the cannula. All I need to do now is just pop the date on the cannula. Sometimes we mightn't be sure about the circumstances of how some IV lines were placed. Peripheral IV cannula inserted outside the hospital or those put in during a medical emergency may not be as clean as usual and are more likely to become infected. In these cases they should be removed or replaced. All insertion points should be protected by an intact dressing. If the dressing needs to be replaced, this should be performed as an aseptic procedure using a recommended skin antiseptic. When accessing peripheral intravenous lines, hand hygiene, aseptic technique and port cleaning or scrub the hub should be performed and the insertion site monitored frequently for signs of infection. If an IV line isn't being used, it should be removed. Peripheral IVs that have been inserted under aseptic conditions that don't have signs of infection may usually remain in place for up to 72 hours. Although some clinical trials seem to show that leaving them in for longer than three days is safe, these studies were done under very different circumstances than are found in most hospitals. If a line is left in for longer than 72 hours, the risk of infection rises sharply. This may include local infections such as phlebitis, but more significantly may cause bloodstream infection. This is a clinically significant adverse event that requires weeks of antibiotics with a 10 to 20% chance of death and is regarded as totally preventable. 
Now we've come to the conclusion of this element of the peripheral IV cannulation training program. Our aim is that you will role model excellence by demonstrating and encouraging best practice amongst your colleagues in the care and management of patients requiring peripheral IV therapy. Our patients will benefit greatly by ensuring that evidence-based practice is delivered to provide a national standard of care focused on preventing and controlling infection. Incorporating the five moments for hand hygiene and safe cannulation techniques are all crucial steps that need to be taken. My name is Deb and one of the doctors has asked me to come and speak to you about putting a small plastic tube or a drip in your arm. Did your doctor explain to you why we needed to do this? Okay, did, yeah, but I'm just wondering if I can take a tablet instead. At the moment we need to give this medication straight into your bloodstream. So that every effort can be made to prevent harm and preserve the future venous access needs for all our patients. That requires weeks of antibiotics with a 10 to 20% chance of death and is regarded as totally preventable. Our aim is that you will role model excellence by demonstrating and encouraging best practice amongst your colleagues in the care and the Insertion of peripheral cannulae should be performed under aseptic conditions using a recommended skin antiseptic. Just notice that this is why it's hypokalemic on compliance, which needs to have that replaced intravenously. I've been contacted by clinical staff about the legal consent process for inserting an 